Good morning, Ozark Christian College. It is good to be back with you. Hey, everyone. Hey, I am just so excited to be here this morning and give you just three quick reasons why you should consider even come to the North American Christian Convention this year. One, as you saw the video, it's going to be a great lineup, a a great week for you there in the beginning of July, and uh, you won't want to miss it. Second, it's it's a great way to connect with people in the ministry, people who you can look up to. In fact, it was at a North American Christian Convention that I first met Tim, who's the president and is going to be speaking to us today, and uh, just a great opportunity to connect connect with those people and to, to find lifelong mentors uh, in those areas. And, and third, for you seniors out there, if you're looking for any motivation, um, we're helping you with some travel funds as well as paying for your hotel and registration fee. You just need to talk to Jill English about that and she'll be able to get you hooked up with uh, what you need to do to be able to make that happen. So I hope you decide and to come out to Indianapolis in July and uh, be with us for the North American. So today we have the president, actually, the North American, Tim Harlow, who's going to preach for us. I got, I got to say a couple things. Um, you know, he is my intern now. You know this, right? Um, and wow, is that so great. Can you guys start like applying for internships in Chicago? We need, we need internships, residents. We just keep getting these people from Lincoln and they're just not very good. And, and um, we, we need to get some stuff going, Okay. Come on, bring it up. I mean, seriously, we're planting churches in Chicago. We got all kinds of connections. We would love to have you up there. And by the way, Chicago was just voted uh, as the uh, second most important place you should move away from recently uh, because it it really is terrible to live there. But we'd love to have you come and hang out with us, okay? (laughs) Uh, shout out to, uh, to my friends. I sat in the balcony right up there. Okay, that was my place up there. Balcony people, like, come in late, sit there. You don't have to pay attention. That's me right there, okay? I love you. And uh, also, I'm going to make some inappropriate comments today, so I just want to remind you that I was from Williamson Third when I was at Ozark Christian College. Okay. All right, that, that's all I got to say. Oh, and by the way, Matt Proctor told me to tell you class is dismissed for the rest of the day. That's all I got. I want, to, I want to play you a video because part, part of the deal, I mean, the whole Williamson third rep and, uh, and, and, the, and the deal with, um, you know, what it was like for me uh, 30 years ago when I was in college here, uh, I was in trouble a lot. I, I don't know if that, you know, I, I don't know if anybody can relate to that, but I was in the dean's office a lot. Uh, I had some issues. Uh, and, and a lot of it, I mean, a lot of it was because I was just a, a cocky little punk that needed to, you know, be brought down a notch or two. But part of it was, um, there, there, you know, I just had a hard time looking through the lens of Christianity at the world the way everybody else did. And, and, and I don't think it's that way at, at all here anymore, but you know, back in, in my day when I was growing up, there was this, there was this feeling of, you know, we got to be over here and the world needs to come and be like us. And that's, you know, if, we, if the world wants to come and hang out, you know, and find Jesus, that's all great, but we got, we got to be over here, okay? I've got this video. It's actually just an audio file. I got to play it for you because it's hilarious. Um, th- this guy is witnessing, it's just the audio file. He's talking on his phone, but I got the, the words up. He's witnessed an accident happen and it kind of symbolizes for me the whole problem of Christianity. Let's just watch. Hey Mark, excuse me, I'm on my way to 3768. Kind of got hung up, it's raining out here, I'm on my way into Dallas. Uh, thought, whoa, whoa, man, I just had a wreck right in front of me. This guy ran a red light and hit, uh, hit four old ladies in a in an Impala, just kind of clipped them and turned them around right in front of me, man, that was close. Oh, now this guy's getting out of his car, got a, he's got a white shirt on with a tie and a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, he's throwing his hands up in the air like he, like, like it was their fault. Oh, hold on, hold on. He's going over to their window. Oh, man, she, I think she sprayed him with pepper spray, man. He's holding his, he's holding his face and he's on his knees. She's getting out. She's beating him with an umbrella. <laughs> the other women are getting out, too. <laughs> ah, there's one woman with a little black person. She's tomahawking him, man. She looks, she looks like a Sun Belt 20, 20 horsepower jackhammer. Blah, blah, blah. She, we got another woman that's... 
She's in there like, like she's got a cattle prod, man. She's got, a, she's got an umbrella and she's sticking it in its side. Oh, there's another one. That, it's a little woman who looks like Mother Goose. <laughs> she's got... Oh, she beat him. She beat him. She's got this huge big bag. It's huge. It's about the size of her. She's about four foot nothing. She hit him over the head. Everything went all over the place. Her Bible fell. She just hit him in there with a Bible. <laughs> That's my problem, okay? When I, when I grew up, the, the era that I was growing up with, we liked to beat people over the head with the Bible. And I got to tell you, it was not the most effective way of reaching lost people. I don't know if you know that or not. It's going to be hard for her. I mean, no matter what, it's going to be hard for her to invite that guy to church, don't you think? It's going to be hard for her. And by the way, Jesus loves you. Bam! I mean, that doesn't work. But that was the era that I grew up in. You know, I mean, we, 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 were, you know, we were told that, you know, I know you're not, you're not going to understand this because CDs can't be played backwards, but back in my day, we had records, and, uh, and, and we, were, we were told that if you played your records backwards, which was so dumb because I never figured out how you could even do that, but if you played your, some of your records backwards, that they would play satanic messages. And so they were telling me I had to burn my Zeppelin and my Eagles, and you know I had to burn all my records because they were satanic. I'm like, man, Hotel California is the best guitar duet ever produced. Can I get an amen? I mean, there's no way I'm burning that. I don't care if it's got a satanic message backwards. I think you're making that up. By the way, do you know if you play Dora the Explorer scene theme song backwards, it says, Hail Satan, I'm just telling you. Go look it up. It's on YouTube. That was the era that I grew up, okay? And we come into the 21st century, and what do we have? Well, we have a lot of the same thing. We, we have a lot of the same thing. Uh, this guy, when Katy Perry's you know, first song came out, uh, this, this pastor or some Baptist church in Ohio put out on his marquee a sign that said, I kissed a girl, and I liked it, and then I went to hell. Really? I mean, do you think somebody from the LGBT community was ever going to be driving by going, oh, hell, I never thought of that. Wow, that's so helpful. Maybe I'll stop at this church and they can tell me about Jesus. No, I'm guaranteeing you, it never happened. So here's the deal. What, what, what are we here for? What is our mission? Uh, the, the reason that we're here for, I like the way Rick Warren says it. He says, there's only two things that you can do here that you can't do in heaven. Sin and tell people about Jesus. Which one of them do you think he left you here to do? I mean, you don't have to tell people about Jesus in heaven because everybody's going to know and there is no sin in heaven. So why in the world, why don't we just get, you know, vaporized back up to heaven as soon as we become believers? Why does that not happen? Because we have a mission, ladies and gentlemen. We have a mission that we're supposed to be on and that was the great commission, right? That was to be his witnesses, uh, not to beat people up over the head with the Bible, not to put out our, you know, our signs out on our billboards and hope that they understand about hell and maybe they'll come in and be repentant we're supposed to go to them what did Jesus do I mean when you read the life of Jesus over and over again what you find out is that Jesus was hunging, hanging out with the Katy Perry's and the Led Zeppelins and the Eagles that's who he was with all the time I'm in Matthew 9. If you got your Bibles, you can turn over there. This is the Matthew story. You may know it well, but I, I want to take you back through this today because it's so important to the mission. The back story is Jesus and the gang have, uh, have been hanging out, and they come up to this bridge or this border. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, uh, but here's the Monty Python picture because this is exactly what it was like for them, okay? They come up to this bridge, and there's a tax collector there, right? Answer me these questions three. That's what Matthew said. I'm pretty sure it's not in the text, but that's what he said. And they come up to the tax collector, and there is Matthew there. Who is Matthew? He is the, like the low life of the universe, right? He's the worst guy you could possibly run into. He's the person that is the tax collector. You notice that in the Bible, there was always a separate category for sinners and then tax collectors, right? I mean, there were sinners and then there were really bad sinners and they were the tax collectors. Why? Because they were the sellouts from the Jews who were working for the Romans 
and nobody wanted to be around them at all. And just like today, there were all kind of taxes for every different kind of thing. And so he could charge whatever he wanted to. He could set up shop wherever he wanted to, and he could go charge taxes, and everybody hated them. And they were considered the lowest of the low. Okay, so you get to Matthew 9, 9, and it says, as Jesus went on from there, we don't have a ton of the story here, but all we know is as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the bridge at the tax collector's booth. And what did he say? Follow me. He told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Okay, grab the implication of this. Imagine that you're the other disciples, you know, hanging out with Jesus at this point. Remember this, okay? You you see this lousy jerk of a guy, the most hated person in Israel, and you see him, and you think to yourself, he steals from his own people, and he likes it, and he went to hell, right? I mean, that's what you're thinking right about there. You're like, I don't want to have anything to do with this guy. That was probably, you know, they probably thought, Jesus, get out your hardback NBI version and whack him up against the side of the head. Remember James and John, one time they're like, Jesus, should we call down, you know, lightning from heaven on this town in Samaria because we don't like him? And that, that's, that had to be what they were thinking. And what does Jesus say to this lousy, no good guy? He says, follow me. Last two words you'd expect Jesus to say. Repent, sinner. Yeah. Follow me. No. And then it dawns on them, I think, somewhere right around in here. Wait a minute. Follow me means he's going to hang out with us. Hang on a second. We don't want this guy hanging out with us, right? Here we get into the Christian attitude, which has probably started already. I'm making all this up, but I guarantee you they weren't happy about the fact that this sinner guy was going to be hanging out with them now. And by by the way, what else does it say that Jesus said there to Matthew? Nothing. Zip. Nothing. Jesus doesn't say, hey, if you want to follow me, you need to, you know, Clean up your act. You need to stop doing this. You need to stop doing that. You need to change your life completely. You know, by the way, you know, Matthew, we are Christians. We don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls who do. Make sure you understand all of those things, right? There's no record of any of this, guys. Why? Because Jesus wasn't inviting him to a religion, he was inviting him to a relationship. And then in another moment where I wish we had more information from the Bible, It says, the very next verse, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house. Okay, so we go from follow me, Matthew followed him, to having dinner at Jesus' house. What happened? I don't know. Jesus said, follow me. Matthew said, cool. What are we going to do now? Jesus says, I'm hungry. Let's go eat. Matthew says, hey, I got, you know, I'm rich. Let's go over to my house. I got lots of food. And by the way, can I invite some of my friends? And Jesus says, absolutely. Absolutely. Greatest day of Matthew's life. Suddenly he's gone from being the low life of the universe to belonging to this cool teacher, this cool guy who's coming along and everybody's following him and he's going to come over to his house. But process this. Who is going to be at Matthew's house? Who does Matthew know? Who are his friends? He doesn't have a a small group, right? He's not in a discipleship group. These are other sinners, It's really important that you process the fact that Jesus went to a sinner party. And it's very easy to know that because the religious people get mad. They get mad at him. One time Jesus was quoting their anger. He said, the son of man has come eating and drinking. And you say, behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Basically what Jesus is saying is, yeah, absolutely, that's who I am. I'm not a glutton, I'm not a drunkard, but I am a friend of sinners. That's who I am. I go to sinner parties, ladies and gentlemen. That's what I do. In Luke 14, 1 through 6, we find out that Jesus goes to a Pharisee party, and one of the other guys comes in, and Jesus heals them on the Sabbath. And they are mad about it, right? Why are they mad about it? Because you're supposed to be following the rules. And Jesus said, no, the the rules are for us. I'm supposed to to take care of people. In another passage, he, he heals a guy on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees go out to plot to kill him. This is what I love about about the church world. It's not okay to heal on the Sabbath, but it's okay to plot murder on the Sabbath, right? Is this brilliant? Okay. So you wonder, why does Jesus prefer, it seems, to hang out with sinners than religious people? Well, big duh. Imagine the conversations at Matthew's party, right? Imagine that. They'd heard about Jesus. They couldn't believe that Jesus was here. They couldn't believe that they got the opportunity to be close to him. But try to picture it for a second, Okay. Try to picture Matthew party. Matthew does not know any better. 
So he's over there. Everybody's there. They got people on the deck. They got people, you know, in the living room. Matthew's running around restocking the beer cooler. There's non-Christian music on the stereo. He hasn't even heard of Mercy Me yet. He didn't even know there were Christian radio stations. You know what I'm saying? Baby, you a song. Make me want to roll my wind. And you know he had a kick in subwoofer because he was rich. I'm telling you, this party was jumping. That's where he was. That's where Jesus was. And, and the Bible, Bible even goes on and it says, many, emphasize that, tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. I mean, the party just kept growing and kept growing and kept growing. And does this make the religious people happy? No. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Read that. Why is your teacher at the naughty people party? It's so obviously offensive. You ate with sinners and you liked it. (laughs) Yeah, they were sinners. They were guilty. Case closed. Had they changed? No, they couldn't have changed yet. You know, we do, we do mass baptisms. We baptized 1,200 people last year at our church. We do mass baptisms because we find that, you know, when we just give people the spontaneous message of the gospel and they can respond to it right there, they jump in in their clothes. All kinds of great stories about that. But a lot of times people are like, well, do they really know everything about what they're doing? I mean, how, how are you able to really fully disciple those people? I would go back to the very book of Acts and say, how did 3,000 people get started with 12 disciples, you know? You just go. You just do it. This is what our mission is. They hadn't changed yet. They didn't know everything they were supposed to know. But Jesus wasn't inviting them to a religion. He was inviting them to a relationship. On hearing this, the Bible says, on hearing this, why are you at the naughty people party? Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. That's why I'm here. And ladies and gentlemen, that is why you are here. If you're so good at, you know, taking care of your own sin, then go out there and knock yourself out. But if you're sick like the rest of us, he goes on, he says, go and learn what this means, which is a real dig to these Pharisees. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Up front goal, right here, this is what I'm here for. Not fake little holy people burning their records. Not, not people that live in their little church and get away from their devil music and put messages out on their sign that tell everybody else they're going to hell. I'm talking about I'm here for the sinners. That's what I'm here for. That's why I came, to seek and to save the lost. As a matter of fact, there's another parable in Luke 14. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to go get the people. And he said, come, everything's ready. But they began to make excuses. And the servant came back and reported this to the master. And the owner of the house became angry and ordered and said, go out into the streets and the alleys and bring the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you've done has been done, but what you said has been done, but there's still room. And the master told his servant, then go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Everybody All the sinners, the lame, the blind, spiritually speaking, that's why we're here. That's why we exist for the rest of the sinners that are out there, just like Matthew. So what's the problem? The problem is I work at a church. Um, I'm hanging around church people all the time. What's the problem for you? You go to Ozark Christian College. You hang around church people all the time. But if we're going to be like Jesus, you know, I mean, I think a lot of times we talk about being a disciple of Jesus and we say, you know, well, that means I'm going to, you know, know my Bible and I'm going to pray and I'm going to do all those things. And and it does. But if you're really going to be like Jesus, I got to be around some naughty people because that's who Jesus was. You you realize that the average Christian, after they've been a Christian for like seven years, have no non-Christian friends. And I can remember from being in Bible college what it was like, you know, to be surrounded. And it's a great time to be, you know, in your spiritual life to be around. And I'm not saying you need to go out and, and be around people that might tempt you. But I'm telling you that if we're going to be like Jesus, we need to be around sinners. Because that's our mission. That's why we're here. One day I was, uh, I was at the health club. This is why I go to the health club. Just for us, this has been an important part of living in our neighborhood. I could work out in the basement, you know, I mean, we could do a lot of things, but our kids, our kids were in public school and we were a part of a neighborhood and this is what we did because I believe in this mission this much. I'm just going to tell you that. And so I work out this health club and I'm walking in between a couple of the machines at the health club 
And, um, and, I, I, and I, I walked up next to this guy. There's a picture of, of Mike, okay? Yeah. He's a bike builder, a painter, ex-mercenary, ex-Hells Angel, can bench press a small truck. That's Mike. And I said, hey, man, how's it going? You know, which was just kind of my way of saying, dear sir, please don't kill me if I'm close to the machines that you want to use right now, okay? And he turns to me. I didn't think he knew me at all. He turns to me and he goes, eh, not so good, man. I ought to come in and talk to you. I'm like, oh, okay, well. Let's do that. And I gave him my cell phone number, and he ended up calling me, and we ended up into a relationship. Turned out his life is, is a mess. He's cheating on his second wife, and you know his first wife's already divorced him, and he's cheating on his second wife, and, and everything is a big mess. And over time, I found out a lot of deeper stuff that's gone on in his life and why he ran with the Hells Angels and why he was the way that he was. But we started working out together. He was a Matthew for me. We started working out together. But it was awkward. i got to be honest with you. It was awkward. Because he would stare at, gawk at every woman that was in the place. He would work out in strip club t-shirts, cut off strip club t-shirts. I'd try to get him to turn them, you know, t- turn them inside out. Because people, you know, half the people in there go to my church. I'm like, dude, come on. No, no, this is my shirt, you know. And it embarrassed me, i got to admit, for a little while. And then I started to feel like Jesus because I think that's exactly the kind of person Jesus would be around. If I'm supposed to be a disciple of Jesus, that's really what's supposed to happen. And really, probably one of the best signs, this is going to kind of stun you, but one of the best signs that you look like Jesus is if religious people are talking bad about you. Good news is, Mike is now at the banquet table, got to baptize him a few months ago, and it was one of the joys of my life. And his life is not all together yet. Let me tell you, the discipleship process is long. He now comes to Parkview with his first wife, his second wife, and his current girlfriend, you know? And we got a big church. They can can all come to different services, all right? And we got all kinds of stories like that. Uh, Center people that are at our place. It's it's crazy being around our place. Christmas Eve services. One of our interns came up to me. We did 14 Christmas Eve services. One of our interns came up to me, and he uh, said, I think somebody's smoking pot in the bathroom (laughs) during a Christmas Eve service. I didn't know whether to be more alarmed by the fact that somebody was smoking pot in our bathroom during Christmas Eve or the fact that one of our interns knew what pot smelled like. I, I didn't know. But it was troubling. Christmas Eve, the day after Christmas, we had our cleaning crew came in and they cleaned up after all of our services and they found an unused, unopened condom on the floor of the worship service. They have to process that for a little bit, okay? What does that mean? Well, that means that some Matthew guy came to one of our services, some Matthew guy who, you know, kept his, you know, protection in his wallet, who wasn't sure where he was going out or who he was going to meet that night after the Christmas Eve service. And if you keep processing it, it's brilliant, it's beautiful, because we were taking up an offering to buy coats for for kids in Humboldt Park in an under-resourced area of Chicago. So all I can guess is what happened is he actually got his wallet out to give to God, and in the process, his condom, his in case of emergency, Emergency fell on the floor. I told our congregation, you, you just gotta, you gotta love that story because those are the kind of people we're supposed to be reaching. And not only that, but next year when you look up here and see a live baby Jesus on the stage, realize it could be literally the gift of last year's Christmas Eve offering. Huh? <laughs> Sinners are messy, okay? I got to tell you, this Matthew stuff is not easy. They're messy. Uh, A few months ago, I mean, just had this great story happen. This is Biker Mike baptizing one of his friends who was a biker outlaw. Uh, Three months before this picture was taken, these two guys were from the Bloods and the Crips. If you know gangs, they were from different gangs. If they would have seen each other in a bar, they would have killed each other. And there they are hugging in the baptistry. That's what Jesus does. And that's the mission of Jesus. And that's why we're here. And that's the kind of ministry that I want to be a part of, don't you? So now, so now there's this classic other moment where, um, you know, I'm at, the, <laughs> I'm at the health club with Mike, and now he is an evangelist. Because you see, as soon as you find the good news, you're supposed to tell everybody else. As soon as it happens, you're supposed to tell them. And... Um, so he's telling everybody, hey, man, I found Jesus. You got to come to church. You got to come to church. So this young guy is there, 
And uh, he's been working on them. And he said, you know, hey, did you go to church this last weekend? And, and, and I just, I, I, have to, I have to use the language that he used so that you can understand this, okay? And I apologize to Seth Wilson and all who've gone before me, but I got to say it the way that I got to say it, okay? He, he said, hey, man, have you been to church? And, um, and Adam said, no, I haven't been to church. I didn't go to church this weekend. And Mike goes, oh, that's right, I forgot. You're a heathen bastard. This is biker Mike with like two ex-wives. You know, he's calling this other guy a, a heathen person, <laughs> right? Isn't that awesome? I mean, when you think about it, when you process it, you're like, oh, yeah, you're a heathen, right? It was just cracking me up. But, but that's what happens when you find Jesus. You're just like, now all of a sudden, Mike's a spiritual giant, and he's trying to disciple this other guy, and he's doing it in his own language the way that he always does, right? So my question for you is, do you have an HB in your life? I know you thought the magnet was for Holy Bible or heaven bound or... And I'm not really comfortable with you using that word, so we'll call it heathen buddy. Do you have a heathen buddy, okay? <laughs> I gave you this magnet. If you didn't get one, get one on the way out because I want to remind you that if you're going to look like Jesus, there should always be a heathen buddy in your life. And if you don't have a heathen buddy, you don't look like Jesus because that's why you're here. That's the purpose of your life, to have a heathen buddy. Actually, the reason that I'm here is because of a heathen buddy. I mean, the reason, the reason that I'm here is because somebody, you know, I was a heathen buddy to somebody else. And the reason that you're here is because you were a heathen buddy to somebody else. And as you get involved in these relationships, that's what's going to change the world. That's how everything is going to be different. I have a son-in-law who was my daughter's HB. She went to England as a, uh, as a, as a college student to do, open a campus ministry over there. And she met this young, you know, really smart computer programming guy um, that was uh, going to the University of Birmingham in England. And she met him and got to be friends, and he was her HB. And, and the story of him coming to Christ is just amazing because it all happened over the Internet. So I've got all of their stuff that they, that they you know, wrote out, uh, all the conversations that they had back together. And, and finally, there was this one moment where I could see what was going on in Ash's mind. And Ash basically said, he said, you know, had you come at me with all of your arguments for Jesus, had you come at me with your rules, had you come at me with, you know, any kind of condemnation, or even trying to argue me into the kingdom of God, you, you, you couldn't have done it. It wouldn't have mattered because I'm, I would have, and I have in the past, put everybody in their place. But Ash said in this one email where I could see he was crossing the line, and Rachel got to go back over and baptize him, and it's just, it just a really, really cool story. But I could see in this one email, he said, here's what he said. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to risk an analogy, and you know, it's kind of biblical, so don't be mad at me. But he said, you didn't do any of that stuff, Rachel. All you did in my life was be my friend, and you went over and you stood on a rock. And I looked at you, and I thought, hang on, she's not saying it, but that rock looks sturdier than any of my foundations that I'm on right now. And he said, you don't have to tell me anything because I can see the damned rock. The people that are in your life, they don't, they don't need you to look down your nose at them. They don't need you to feel sorry for them. They don't need for you to come alongside of them and tell them, you need to clean up your stuff. They know they're living in the pigsty. They know they're the prodigal who's turned away. They don't need you to argue them into the kingdom. They need you to love them into the kingdom. They need you to come along. They need to see the rock you're standing on. They need for you to hang out with them and, and, and not accept the, the bad behavior, but to be their friend and to love them because that's who Jesus was. Do you understand that? And if that's who Jesus is, then we're not a disciple unless we've got an HP. We're not a disciple unless we're the person that's going out and doing that very same thing. I know how hard it is when you're a preacher of a church or when you're involved in, in Bible college. I know how hard it is, but I want to tell you something. We have the gospel. We have the good news. 
You know, when I was here, they told me that evangelism was one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. If that's what we've got, this really shouldn't be hard. And when you get out of here and you go to churches, you know, that are probably still putting up billboards about how people are going to hell, whatever, will you please remember who Jesus was? Be patient with them, help them, understand them, but please don't forget who Jesus was. What we're going to do this summer in Indianapolis at the convention that I'm leading, and I'd love to have you come, is we're going to re-mission the church because Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. That's all we have to do. All we have to do is to be a witness. That's what he called us to. And, and don't, 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 think, don't fall for that, oh, well, when I graduate from Bible college, I'll go out and I'll do my ministry thing. Uh-uh. You need an HB right now. Let's pray. God, I pray for Mike and for Kenny and for for Adam, the HB, who still is, and for the people that are all around me in my life now that I get to see that are mess up my cell phone with so many expletive-laden text messages. I don't even know if I could show them to anybody. And that they're, they're in my life, and, and, they, and they drive me crazy because they just don't know the right way to live. And I keep trying to help them, and I keep trying to tell them. But, Lord, it's about you and your conviction, and I know that you're going to be the one who's going to help them along the way. i got to stand on the rock, and i got to tell them what's right. But I do it in love, just like you did. First thing you did is you went out and made relationships with people. That was your mission to seek and to save the lost. The healthy didn't need a doctor, the sick do. So we shouldn't be surprised when the people around us appear sick. That's who we're supposed to be with. That's who you were with. And Lord, if the religious people are mad at us every once in a while, help us to have a lot of grace for them. Help us to have a lot of forgiveness for them. But please, don't let anybody in this room forget that the reason we're here is to tell people about Jesus to make disciples. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thanks, everybody.